from Seattle, Washington, it's theCUBE, covering KubeCon and CloudNativeCon North America 2018. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and its ecosystem partners. Okay, welcome back everyone. This is theCUBE's live coverage of three days wall to wall here at KubeCon and CloudNativeCon 2018 in Seattle. We're day three, all the action's happening. This is theCUBE, I'm John Furrier with Stu Miniman. We're here at Brett, Brent Compton, Senior Director of Technical Marketing at Red Hat, breaking down the container storage trends and directions. Obviously containers, obviously super important. That's happened, Kubernetes has happened. Now new things are happening around, a lot of innovation. All right, thanks for coming on theCUBE, appreciate it. Thanks for having me back. So what's the state of the, the art of, of containers, the trends, some of the market directions, what's going on around containers? Well here at this show, of course, it's been all about um, service mesh, right? Istio, service mesh, uh, um, dynamically, um, dynamic discovery, dynamic invocation uh, of services, but all of those things, well, a certain percentage of those things, according to the keynote, uh, require some type of persistence, so, uh, so yep, Service message, uh, service meshes, and persistence. So storage is a big part of the networking and, and compute all working together in the cloud. That's been a big part of it. Um, what's, what's important here in this show? What's going on this week that's really impacting that piece of it, the, the container and the storage? You mentioned state versus stateless. Um, a work area, stateless is fine, I mean, no problem, but persistence and state become important in applications. How much conversation has been here this week on that piece? Well, I'll talk about this week and then I'll talk about the last couple of weeks. This week, there, there are a couple of significant things going on that are going to sort of unleash innovation in persistence as it pertains to the Kubernetes subsystem. Uh, the first, of course, is uh, Container Storage Interface, CSI. You know, today, all of, the, uh, uh, all of the volume plugins have been entry. You want to change, you know, some vendor wants to change their, uh, their storage capabilities, they need to recompile the binaries. Uh, very slow, very, uh, very non-agile. Uh, of course, with the, the advent of the container storage interface, uh, it's, okay, here's the common interface, uh, all, the, uh, all the volume plugin providers write to that interface, so they can then, uh, they can iterate to their heart's content without having to change uh, the, the entry source. So the impact is what, speed, Agility, asshole, absolutely, time. agility of innovation. Allowing all those guys to, to innovate. Uh, kind of the second thing, that's it. So that's been a discussion this week. Another thing's been a discussion uh, that you've seen in, the, in some of the uh, sessions and stuff are, is the operator framework. You know, coming uh, championed by the CoreOS guys, of course now part of Red Hat. The operator framework in terms of effectively automating things that human operators would do for complex subsystems such as storage. Uh, so basic installation, base, basic upgrades, uh, um, you know, monitoring those services uh, so when you know, something falls over, what do you do with that type of stuff? So I'd say CSI, Container Storage uh, Interface, as well as Operator Framework. Those are some of the things that have been talked about this week, but I still want to go back and talk about uh, last week, but go, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, Brent, I wonder if you could tease this out a little for, for us. So, you know, last five years, you know, containerization, Kubernetes, you know, massive change in the way we think about architectures. Uh, things like networking and storage have often been the anchor to kind of hold us down to be able to make changes faster. Virtualization helped some, but, you know, containerization, we're going to have to fix some of these same things. What are the conversations you're having with customers? You know, give us the latest on you know, the state versus state falls. We heard in the keynote, uh, it was, they said 40% of deployments uh, have you know, stateful uh, applications out there. Depending on numbers, you know, it's definitely it's been growing, and at least I, I, I can do it, as opposed to you know, two years ago, it was like, okay, we're doing containers, but we're just going to do stateless for now, and we'll try to figure out what architecture is going to work. Um, even a year ago at this show, I heard in the back rooms there were lots of arguments as to which one of the storage projects uh, was going to lead, and it seems, seems like we're getting some maturity. So help, help give us some visibility as to where we are, and you know, what's working, and what still needs to be done. So although the industry talks about um, serverless, uh, they're not yet talking about dataless <laughs> the, uh, or storageless. I mean, it, you know, if we throw out the basic principle of data gravity, data is the sun around which um, applications, uh, services rotate. And so even, I mean, even stateless apps, stateless apps still do I.O. Frequently the, the I.O. of stateless apps is, you know, via RESTful puts and gets to an object store 
Um, that actually brings me, so let's, let's talk about, uh, let's unpack the, uh, um, the stateless and then let's go to stateful. Um, that, so I'm going to come back to uh, some of the conversations a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Red Hat announced the acquisition of Nuba, uh, an Israeli company. So when you think about what Nuba plus Ceph uh, do to provide stateless apps, uh, with a common set of data, serv uh, a common set of data, uh, data services across the hybrid and multi-cloud. So those stateless apps saying, okay, I'm going to do, I'm going to do RESTful puts and gets, but man, it's complicated if I'm going to have to develop to various proprietary protocols. I've got the, you know, the Azure Blob protocol. I've got AWS S3. I'm talking to. Google Persistent Disk, and then if I want to run hybrid, I'm also talking to Ceph object storage on premises. And if I'm a developer, I'm thinking, man, wouldn't it be nice if I had a common set of data services, including common protocol, to talk to all of those uh, different uh, um, cloud storage backends. So Nuba, uh, some people kind of call it a, a cloud storage controller, provides that kind of common data services. So things like common API protocol. Um, things like uh, uh, mirroring, so you, you want to write, uh, write once, your app writes once, and then it's mirrored across the various cloud object storage backends to facilitate easy migration. You say, okay, I want to I uproot to move over here. Yeah. Your data is already there. So that's, uh, uh, that's a couple of reasons uh, and some of the conversation from a couple weeks ago about how Nuba plus Ceph are helping stateless apps get uh, hybrid and multi-cloud. This, I think, that is a great point. Um, you talk about hybrid cloud and multi-cloud coming around the corner, which is about choice, right? But the CI, CD pipelining of having a consistent developer environment clearly is one of the main benefits we're seeing in this community here. Okay, I got some software developers, we're going to crank, teams move around, we've got consistency, no matter where, where the environment is, it's just really uh, some, good, some goodness there. Storage is interesting and data is interesting because you're right, the sun is the data and everything's orbiting around it. That's the holy grail. This is what people want. They want addressable data, they want it real time, they want to have it access. They don't want to have to do all this code to configure, manage data. And it's complicated, you got data warehouses, you got time series data. So data is getting more complicated, but it needs to be simpler. So this is kind of the challenge of the industry. How are you guys seeing that with OpenShift? How does your container piece fit in? How do you guys make that easy for customers to say, look, I want to have not just a data lake, I want an intelligent, fabric of access to data so my apps don't have to do all the heavy lifting. It's almost like DevOps for data. It's like data ops. It's like, I need to have programmable data. Yeah, This no, is absolutely. kind of the... Absolutely. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah. So first I want to address that in two ways. The first is about OpenShift itself. That, what you described is in fact the sweet spot of what OpenShift is. Providing a common set of Kubernetes services plus CI CD pipeline services uh, for developers and operation staff independent of your cloud infrastructure. So whether OpenShift is running on top of AWS, whether it's running on top of Azure, whether it's running on top of uh, GCP, whether it's running on premises, on bare metal, whether, you know, common set of Kubernetes services and CI CD pipeline services. Okay, that's so what you described there, I just wanted to just highlight that. That is yeah. OpenShift, hybrid multi. Yeah, okay, super so valuable check, that's awesome. Check. Data. Now coming down, uh, yeah. coming down to data. Yeah. So in fact, OpenShift container storage is the mirror analog to OpenShift for the, providing a common set of Kubernetes volume services independent of what the storage substrate is. So think about it if you're, if you're inside of AWS. You've got EBS is what's, you know, when in Rome, act as the Romans, you've got EBS there when you're inside of AWS. Well, the, the, the type of Kubernetes volume services that ED, the EBS provides natively differ than, for instance, when you're on-premises and it's surfacing via an NFS plugin. Uh, uh, maybe different likewise where you're inside of uh, Azure with, with uh, um, Azure Persistent Disk. So OpenShift Container Storage provides the same type of abstraction layer, providing a common set of Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes volume services independent of what the storage server uh, layer is. So On both the cloud, of the so if you guys abstract away the complexity, so the app developer doesn't have to do anything about storage on those discrete platforms. It doesn't have to do anything about storage and provides a common set of services instead of, well, let's see, this is running on this cloud, I don't okay, have the, right. uh, I have a different set of services, so common set of services. So, so 
Brent, one of the things I love about talking to Red Hat at these shows is you actually have a lot of customers that are doing this. We, we actually, we spoke to one of your customers yesterday, talk about how uh, you know, Kubernetes is helping them create sustainable data centers uh, over in Europe and the Nordics especially. Uh, so uh, Kubernetes is awesome, but what's really awesome is the things that we can do on top of it. Wonder if you've got, you know, help connect some of this to you know, your customers, real things. You know, how does this you know, change the game? How does it change their teams? Uh, you know, what, 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 what can you share with us? One of the things that I can, what's, what's top of mind, so what's not top of mind for me at the moment is, you, you know, what kind of new, how they're reinventing the world. Yeah. What is top of mind with, with me right now, we've just been studying our, our, our results, is we look back, and, and this is a, a little bit of a, a, okay, it's a trend, but it's a different kind of trend that you're talking about. In the last six quarters, uh, we've had 600% growth with OpenShift container storage. Yeah. Uh, um, so, uh, and now, we, so in the last six quarters, we're also at a point now we're seeing some of those same folks from the Nordics you're, you're describing that are coming back now, you know, they, they've experimented, uh, so there are, some, um, there are some, some cruise ship, there's a cruise ship company that has deployed uh, uh, this uh, on, on ships. What we're now seeing, what's, what's very gratifying for us is they're coming back now for a second pass. Now a year into it, it's okay, clearly it must be providing enough value that you're coming back, it's okay, I want to buy this for another ship or more ships. So that's gratifying for us. The first year was, let's, see, let's, let's try this Kubernetes, this OpenShift container store stuff out, but you know, coming back to the trough for another take, it's good for us. And what's going around the corner, obviously OpenShift's been doing great, I love this abstraction layer. We're seeing for the first time in the industry clear visibility and real value proposition. <laughs> Stu and I were joking yesterday, you know, if we were at OpenStack years ago or even KubeCon three years ago, we would ask the question, if you had a magic wand, what would you hope to have happen? It's actually some of the things that are actually happening. Yeah. I mean, clean, heavy lifting's gone on all the developer side, consistency, um, productivity, competitive advantage on the application development side, and then taking away all the hassles of having to either train people on multiple clouds. So this is kind of happening. What's next? So what's the next, next uh, bowling pin to fall down? What's the, well, you know, hit the front pin, what's next, what's going on? How do you guys see the, uh, the next innovation around OpenShift and storage containers? Cloud independent, data services and mobility. So independent of the clouds, yep. and again, it's hybrid too, so you don't want to be locked into your own cloud either. So cloud independent, data services and mobility. So you say, listen, I, I want to be, I want to have a common uh, um, uh, um, dedupe, compression, uh, uh, mirroring, but I want to sit at a layer above my clouds, back to the data gravity thing. Yeah. I want to ensure that my data is where I need it on different clouds, so I'm elevating to a new layer, this, uh, this cloud storage controller, this, uh, this uh, um, cloud independent set of data services. Yeah. We think that's where the puck's going. Yeah, I think the data, data is critical, I think. I mean, we, we said years ago, data ops. There's a DevOps model for yeah. data. If you look at it that way, it's not just putting it into a data lake, it's actually making it useful. Yeah, no, it. absolutely. Brent, thanks for coming on theCUBE. We're here bringing all the data here in theCUBE. We're sharing it here, live in Seattle. This is our third year at KubeCon. We've been there from the beginning. This is theCUBE's coverage of Cloud Native Con and KubeCon, bringing all the action here with Red Hat on theCUBE. Back with more live coverage, stay with us. Day three of three days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage. We'll be back after this short break.